Good morning. It is time for our worship service to begin. Before I actually begin with our worship service, just a few announcements. Again, a hearty welcome to our visitors that we have. Indeed, you're our honored guest. We're pleased that you came our way this morning. We ask if you would, uh, there's a little blue card on the back of the queue in front of you, if you'd fill that out and either place it in one of the baskets at the entrances or leave it on the seat so we have a record of your attendance. And please stick around so we can become better acquainted. Uh, as you do know, we have two nurseries. We have an attended nursery. If you go out the door to my left and just follow the hallway around at the end of the hallway, there's an attendant there that will be glad to watch children ages zero to three if you have need of that. And also, if you go out the door at the back of the auditorium, turn left, go up there stairs, there's an attend unattended nursery there if you have need of that as well. Uh, if, if you would now, we'll begin our worship service with a word of prayer. Righteous Father in heaven, we come before thee now, so thankful that we have this chance to assemble here, Father, this privilege to worship thee in spirit and in truth as outlined in your word. We just pray now, Father, as we go into this period of our service, that we truly concentrate on what our purpose is for being here, and that's to show you the, the glory and the reverence that you deserve, Father, and we concentrate fully and wholly on the lessons and the songs and the prayers. Be with us now, Father. We're so thankful for our blessings of life that we enjoy each and every day, Father. We just pray that as we enjoy these blessings that we realize that they all come through Thee. Father, there's many that are hurting now at this time. There are many on our prayer list, Father, that are sick. We just pray you'll be with them in the hands that are ministering unto them that they can grant, be granted their much wanted help. There are those that have lost loved ones. We pray, you, Father, you give them the true comfort and peace that they need. Continue to be with us, Father, and let, may we let your word guide us in all that we do, Father. Continue to be with us now, Father, as we live our everyday lives, that our example of those we come in contact with is one that is Christ-like in all things. Through Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, were you happy to get that hour back that you lost this spring? We'll begin this morning with number 466, I Need Thee Every Hour.
The next song will be in the book, number 447, Son of My Soul. Son of my soul, our Savior dear, it is not I. Father, Lord, thank you for bringing us here together today. Please help our worship to be a sweet-smelling sacrifice to you, and thank you for allowing us to, to be able to, to worship you. Please help this worship to restore our souls so that when we go back out into the world, we can be beacons of light and we can show people the way to the church. And please help us to keep our minds on you as we continue through this worship. In your son's name we pray. Amen. few moments we'll have our weekly opportunity to partake of the Lord's Supper. Before that we'll sing Night with Evan Pinion. Night with Evan Take of the Lord's Supper. If you uh, have not yet uh, received or have uh, one of the uh, cups with the uh, bread and fruit of the vine, if you'd hold up your hand, there's a gentleman in the back who will bring you one. No one? Everyone is ready. 
Reading from 1 John, uh, sorry, well, let me correct that. John 1, verse 29, the next day he, and the he is John the Baptist, the next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This reference to the Lamb of God comes up twice more in the, in the Gospels in Mark 14 and Luke 22 on the day of unleavened bread in which the Passover lamb was sacrificed. And then Paul in 1 Corinthians 5 refers to Jesus as the Passover lamb. And that is the event, the ceremony, the exercise in which we're about to engage. We consider Jesus Christ, the Passover lamb, the lamb who takes away the sins of the world, as John the Baptist said, and on the night that he was betrayed, on that night of the unleavened bread, Jesus took two of the sacraments or two of the elements, if you will, of the Passover supper. He took the unleavened bread and he took the fruit of the vine and presented those to his disciples, telling them that this is how in all future generations they, we would remember through our worship the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Would you all pray with me for the bread? Father, we thank you for this bread, which we will partake in just a moment here, and we know that that represents your body, as you tell us in the Gospels, that this is, this is my body, take and eat, for remembrance of the great things that Jesus Christ did for us and to proclaim his death. And Father, we thank you for the sacrifice your son made for us, and it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Let's now pray for the fruit of the vine. And Lord, just as your son was willing to sacrifice his body for us to be nailed to the cross, we know there was the spilling of his blood through the flogging, Father, through the march through Jerusalem and through hanging on the cross. His blood was spilled for us and that blood now redeems us. We come in contact with that blood through this, through this event, Father, in which we are partaking. We thank you, Lord, for a sacrifice, and it's in his name that we pray. Amen. That concludes the Lord's Supper. We will also say a few words at the conclusion of the Lord's Supper regarding our offering. You're familiar as members with the means by which we give. We can uh, uh, pay through uh, or pay uh, 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 through the baskets that are uh, located around the auditorium. Uh, many of us now are using an automated means of paying, either through an app on our phones or uh, check to bank or whatever uh, bank to. Uh, the church or whatever the means may be. We remember that the offering, uh, the examples that we see in the New Testament of the, of the widow giving the last two copper coins that she had, that the giving is sacrificial. It's also done in great faith. It's part of our worship and it's also done joyfully. And let's keep those things in mind now while we pray for our offering. Father, we thank you for giving us this building, giving us preachers that, that, that can bring us the word and, and we compensate them for and pay them for their great work that they do for us. And the other needs that we have, Father, whether it be um, the upkeep of this building and most importantly, Father, our mission works, our, our uh, benevolence, Lord, and other, other good works that we do through these funds that we receive. We thank you for the generous giving we enjoy in this congregation. We thank you for blessing us such that, that we can give generously and in, in quantity, Father, and we thank you for these things. Lord, may you watch over this church and protect us, Father, in our giving and, and the attitude we have towards our giving because we know, Father, that you love a cheerful giver. Lord, we thank you in Jesus' name, amen. We're sing hallelujah, what a savior. After that is the scripture reading. So let's stand for the song and we can remain standing for Joseph's reading of the scripture. 
reading is coming from Mark chapter 10 verse 17 through 22. I'll be reading from NIV. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all this I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give it to the poor, and you will have treasury in heaven. Then come follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went, he went away sad because he had great wealth. Amen. We may see it. You ever had a funny feeling that you've forgotten something? You can't remember what it is you think you forgot. And it just kind of there in the back of your mind nags at you until you either remember it or just finally give up on trying to, to remember what it is. I think we've probably all been there. Man drove his family off for vacation, and every time they left, the mom would say, We're going to have to turn around. I think I left the iron on. And so he would dutifully turn around go back to the house and find that the iron was unplugged and off. Next time they went somewhere, same thing happened. Honey, we're going to have to turn around. I think I left the iron on. He'd turn around, go back, iron was unplugged, everything was fine. About the fourth time that happened, they took off on trip, and guess what? She said, honey, we're going to have to turn around. I think I left the, the iron on. To which he reached under the seat, pulled the iron out, and laid it in her lap. <laughs> And said, no, you didn't. And they never had to worry about it after that again. Our passage that Joseph just read for us today introduces us to a young man who was searching for something. He knew he needed something. He knew that Jesus perhaps could give him that. And so he sought Jesus out. We call him the rich young ruler because that's uh, kind of the name that he's been given. Uh, Matthew tells us he was a young man. Luke describes him as a ruler. Or maybe we would call him an aristocrat. In Matthew and Mark and Luke, they all three tell us he was rich. And so he was a very rich ruler, had everything 
he could possibly want wealth, power, influence, privilege, status in life. But I think we could safely say he had everything and nothing because he didn't have Jesus Christ. And by the end of this story, he still wouldn't have Jesus Christ because as Joseph read to us, he hung his head and went away sorrowfully because he was very, very rich. Millions of people in this world are searching for something. Can't really put their finger on what it is, but they're still searching for it. I don't know if many of you are familiar with Bono and the Irish rock group YouTube, or YouTube, not YouTube. But they recorded a song back in 1987 about that universal search. And it says, I have run, I have crawled, I have scaled these city walls only to be with you, but I still haven't found what I'm looking for. And I think we understand that there are things in life that we just haven't found what we're looking for. Bono uh, had his own brand of faith. And the last verse of that song said of Jesus, you broke the bonds and you loosed the chains Carried the cross of my shame. Oh, my shame. You know I believe it, but I still haven't found what I'm looking for. Bono's now 61 years old. And he has, in later years of his life, become more vocal about his faith and his belief in, in Jesus. And Focus on the Family did an interview with him a few years ago in which he made it clear that he finally thought he had found that relationship with Jesus that he was looking for. Bono's real name, by the way, is Paul David Hewson, and he wears sunglasses because he's got glaucoma, and that's an issue for him with, with bright lights. He said, who is Christ is the defining question for a person. You're not let off easily by saying a great thinker or philosopher. He went around saying he was the Messiah. He was crucified because he was the Son of God. He either was the Son of God or he was nuts. And I find it hard to accept that millions of lives have felt their lives touched and inspired by some nut. I don't believe it. Well, this young man that we're going to talk about this morning came to Jesus. He was successful. He was wealthy. He was looking for something. And he was hoping that Jesus could give it to him. We don't know the young man's name. We call him the rich young ruler because that's kind of what's stuck with him. Some suggest that he's John Mark that we read about later in the, in the Gospels and in the book of Acts. No way to prove that, no way to know that. Some have even suggested it was a young Saul who would later become the persecutor of the church. Again, we don't know, can't know who, who it was, so we'll just call him the rich young ruler. He did things right for the most part. He came at the right time to Jesus. He came to Jesus when he was young. And he came to the right person by coming to Jesus. And he came with the right energy. The text said he was running. He was, he was excited about what it was that he was about to do. And he came with the right attitude. He knelt before Jesus and asked his question. And he even came with the right question. What can I do to have eternal life? The rich young ruler came running, smiling, full of hope. But he walked away full of sorrow, dragging his feet with only his hope in his wealth. And as we think about this encounter, let's look at five things that maybe will be encouraging for us. Strange conversation. Keep the commandments. You say, well, what's strange about that? Well, maybe it's strange because you think, well, that's a given, isn't it? That's the old duh. Yeah, you keep the commandments. Why would he say that to him? We know also that we can't ever keep the commandments good enough to find salvation in our own merit, in our own worth. And so Jesus tells him, keep the commandments. Every Jew knew the Ten Commandments by heart. They know them as well as any of us can count to ten. They were divided into two sections. Uh, the first four commandments having to do with the relationship with God and how you dealt with Him. No other gods, don't make war and worship idols. Never take God's name in vain and remember the Sabbath day. Honor God on the Sabbath day. The second part of the Ten Commandments was interactions with each other, of how we dealt with each other. And Jesus quoted those to him, but if you notice, he omitted one. He omitted one of the, of the commandments. You might have caught them if you had it memorized. What I'm going to do is count to ten and say one, two, three. Four, five, six. What's wrong with that sentence? 
Left out number three. That's what Jesus did in this. He left out one. He didn't give them an order, but let's check it off. Do not murder. Check. Don't commit adultery. Check. Don't steal. Check. Don't bear false witness or defraud. Check. Honor your father and mother. Check. Which one did he leave out? Thou shalt not covet. Hmm, isn't that interesting? That this rich young man came to Jesus and he quoted, here's the commandments you need to keep, but he didn't say anything about coveting there. Was that intentional on Jesus' part? The answer to that is yes. Jesus didn't do anything unless it was very intentional. Jesus could likely see that that was the thing that this young man lacked. He was rich. He was wealthy. And that wealth had become his God. What can we learn from that? Well, we can learn that Jesus will probe our hearts to expose any competing gods. And that's what he did with this young man. What was it? You want eternal life, but what is it that you have that's a God that's going to keep you from having that eternal life? And it was obviously his wealth. It was obviously his, his reliance on his money and on his riches. He had a problem perhaps with greed. And he kept probing until he found it. It's kind of like you go to the doctor and you hurt on your abdomen. And so the doctor does what? He starts poking on your abdomen. And he pokes and he pokes and he pokes and he pokes and finally gets to your appendix. And when he pokes there, what happens? You come up off the table because it hurts so bad. That's what Jesus does through his word. He pokes and he prods till he gets to the, to the truth about what's in our hearts and what's in our minds and what it is that we maybe would claim to be gods, but really are gods in our life. And that's what Jesus did to this young man. He probed him until he got to the issue. And the issue seems to be this young man's wealth was more important to him than anything else. And then the shocking advice. Sell all that you have, give it to the poor, and follow me. Jesus said there was only one thing he was lacking. And that one verse has perhaps caused more confusion and consternation than any other verse perhaps in the Bible. And multitudes read it and thought, I want to obey God so I should go sell everything that I have and give it to the poor and take a vow of poverty to follow Jesus. But here's a short answer to that. You don't need to sell your riches unless your riches are your God. Then that becomes an issue. That was the problem the rich young ruler seemed to have. Nicodemus came to Jesus by night. Nicodemus was wealthy. Jesus didn't say, we'll sell all that you have and give it to the poor. Joseph of Arimathea, who took care of the arrangements for Jesus after he had died on the cross, was a wealthy man. Jesus never told him, we'll sell all that you have and give it to the poor. He only did it for the rich young ruler. Go sell all that you have and give it to the poor. Why? Because Jesus provided a personal solution to remove any competing gods that might have been in the life of this young man. He saw that money was his God. He wanted more and more and more. That's what it means to covet. And Jesus was simply giving the rich young ruler a solution to get rid of that false God in his life. And he's really not saying you're going to lose anything. You aren't losing your treasure. You're just transferring them to someplace else. Mark chapter 10 and verse 29 and 30. Jesus answered and said, Surely I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sister or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake in the Gospels who shall not receive a hundredfold now in this time and in the age to come eternal life. Jesus looked in this man, young man's heart and knew that was what was going to keep him from following God in a way that would mean he could be saved. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus warned, there's only room for one God in your heart. Only one God. No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and man. And the rich young ruler was having an issue with that. You know, Jesus designs different solutions for each person. In Luke 10, a lawyer came to him and asked him the very same question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus didn't say, sell all that you have and give it to the poor, because he knew that wasn't the man's problem. That man's problem was pride. Jesus asked him, what's the greatest commandment? 
And the lawyer said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said, that's correct. And the lawyer looking for a loophole said, well, who is my neighbor? And that's where Jesus got to the heart of the issue. But instead of answering that, what did Jesus do? He told him that story about the good Samaritan. So that this man could see what his problem was, was pride and arrogance and perhaps a little bit of racism mixed in there. In John 4, Jesus was talking to the Samaritan woman at the well. And she did, he didn't tell her, go sell all that you have and give it to the poor. He said, go call your husband. And she said, I don't have a husband. He said, that's right. The five you've had and the one you're living with is not your husband. Jesus was getting to the heart of her issue in life. Pointing out that she already had a God in her life and it wasn't the God of, of the universe. She later, unlike the rich young ruler, became the evangelist for her town. Brought them out to hear Jesus because it touched her heart and she was able to get rid of that competing God in her life. But then that young man made a personal choice. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Mark is the only one who gives us this tiny detail. It says Jesus looked at the young man and loved him. Loved him. And again, Mark is the only one that tells us that of all the Gospels. We know that Jesus loves everyone. But we can remember and understand that He loves us individually. He looks to you personally and He loves you personally. He looks to me personally and loves me personally. Jesus really did want that rich young ruler to make the right choice. With all of his heart, He wanted him to make the right choice. There's a painting by German artist Heinrich Hoffmann. And Hoffman captures the divine drama of the moment. The rich young ruler is seen wearing his fancy clothes and hat. And Jesus is inviting him to give his money to the poor people in the background and then to follow them. And the rich young ruler looks down as he ponders the most important decision he would ever make. Give away all his money and follow Jesus. But he had so much. And in that moment he sadly shakes his head and says, No, the price is too high. And walks away. Not all stories have a happy ending. Not everybody lives happily ever after. And for the rich young ruler, he made the wrong choice in his life by leaving Jesus. Jesus offers us eternal life, but he won't force you to follow. He'll give you every opportunity. He'll give you the means by which to do that, but he never ever forced it upon anyone. This was an amazing in in invitation. Some scholars have suggested that he was inviting the rich young ruler to become what would eventually be the 13th apostle. Again, we don't know that for sure. The text doesn't say. Just think, if the rich young ruler had transferred all of his wealth and followed Jesus, how would he have been remembered rather than how he is actually remembered in life? It bears repeating, God is omnipotent. He is all-powerful. But there is one area of the universe where he still allows choice, and that is whether we follow him or not. He will not force us to accept the gift of eternal life, even if he has to watch you walk away. And then we come to the camel. Camel could squeeze through an eyes and needle easier than a rich person could get into heaven. And Jesus here, I think, employs what we call hyperbole, uh, maybe somewhat of a humorous picture with an outlandish uh, the outlandish scenario to make the point that he's trying to make. A camel trying to get through the eye of a needle. In Matthew 23, he used a pun to describe the Pharisees. He said, you guys strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. And the interesting thing is the Aramaic word for gnat is galama, and the word for camel is gamla. And so they're very similar in the, in the way that they sound. And so Jesus said you could strain out the gamblas to, to swallow the gamla. Not a terribly funny joke, I don't think, but uh, maybe the Jewish people understood it. It's kind of like the cross-eyed school teacher who got fired because she couldn't keep her people straight. <laughs> Some people try to explain this away and say, well, the eye of the needle that's being referred to here is a small gate in the walls of the city of Jerusalem. That if you took off the camel's pack and it got down on its knees, it could actually crawl through there, and that would be more in keeping. But when you read about this, 
and you read the words that are used there, it's the words used for sowing needs. And so Jesus is making the outlandish statement, it's easier for a full-size camel to go through a little bitty hole in the needle than it is for a rich man to get into heaven. The point Jesus is making here, I think it's impossible to gain salvation on our own merit. Because what does he do? He goes on to say in just a few words, with God, all things are possible. God puts a camel through the eye of the needle, and he has the power to do that. Y'all know who Jeff Bezos is? Any of you friends with him? If you are, I'd love you to introduce me. He's, of course, the founder of Amazon and Blue Origin, now listed as the richest man in the world. $177 billion. That's why I'd like to meet him. Hope he'd be generous. He's followed by Elon Musk, who's CEO and founder of Tesla and SpaceX. He's got $151 million. Bernard Arnault is the chair and CEO of LVMH, which is the world's largest luxury goods business. Uh, he's worth $150 billion. Uh, Bill Gates, co-founder of Microsoft, $124 billion. And poor, poor Mark Zuckerberg rounds out that list. He's only got $97 billion. So you got to feel a little sorry for him. Do you know what all these have in common? Those rich, wealthy men need Jesus the same way as any homeless person out here needs Jesus. We all need Jesus no matter where we come from. And we all come to Him the same way. We come as guilty sinners to receive life from Jesus. It doesn't matter who you are. You can be a rich man. You can be a poor man. You can be a thief. You can be a lawyer. You can be a Native American tribal leader. It doesn't matter who you come as long as you come to Jesus on His terms. Because... It's impossible for a rich person or a poor one to enter the kingdom of God on their own merit. Just as it physically, by the laws of physics, is impossible for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. But the good news is, all things are possible with God, including your salvation and my salvation. Disciples were under the impression that rich people were blessed by God. That was kind of the mindset of the day. If you have to be rich and wealthy, then God must favor you. And if you're poor, then you must have done something wrong and God isn't favoring you. That was kind of their mindset at the time. But they asked that, well, who can be saved? Who can be saved if that's the case? And Jesus answered, only with God is that possible. Only with God is that possible. You see, he specializes in what we call miracles. When Moses had an ocean in front of him, an army chasing him, he was in an impossible situation, but that's what God deals with, impossible situations. And he made an expressway through the water, dry land, for Moses and the Israelites to get through. When David faced a nine-foot monster with only a slingshot, victory was impossible by human standards, but God took the impossible, directed that stone to strike Goliath in just the right way that David would be victorious. When Gabriel visited a teenager named Mary, you're going to give birth to the Son of God. And she said, how can I? And the response was, nothing is impossible for God. Luke 1 and verse 37. It's possible for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. Because God can do that. What is a greater miracle? If you want to use that term greater miracle is being saved and in line for eternal life. That's the greatest thing on the face of the planet. And that's the one thing the rich young ruler missed out on. He walked away singing, but I still haven't found what I'm looking for. And as far as we know, he never did. Eternal life can't be earned or bought. It's a gift from God and it's a Shall we say a miraculous thing to know that he's willing to give that to us if we'll do what he's asked us to do? First step to coming to Jesus is an admission that you're a sinner and that you need forgiveness. There are maybe more than one ways to get to heaven. You can die before you reach the age of accountability and that would mean you were safe. But since all of us are still living in here, that doesn't apply to us. You can, you can try this. You can live a perfect life and go to heaven. 
Anybody managing to do that right now? Yeah, I don't think so. Or you can be obedient to the gospel and accept the grace that's offered. Well, how does that work? How does it work? Well, it starts with faith. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, Romans chapter 10 and verse 17. We have to repent of our sins. Truly, these times of ignorance, God overlooked but now commands all men everywhere to repent. And we must make the good confession. Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him will I also confess before my Father who is in heaven. Matthew 10 and verse 32. What does confession sound like? Well, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, is what Peter said. And was be immersed in the waters of baptism. Peter said, repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. That's how it works. That's what he's asked us to do. We can hang our heads and say, the price is too high. And walk away, and he'll let us go. Or we can do what he's asked us to do. The rich young ruler had so much, but he ended up with nothing. Because he didn't have Jesus. And maybe there's something in your life today that's a competing God. That is getting in the way of your acceptance and obedience to Jesus. Maybe we ought to give some thought. What to do to get rid of that competing God. Jesus is probing through his word. Poking until it hurts. And we've got to be willing to submit to that probing. Jesus loves you. He's looking in your heart. And he's saying get rid of anything that will separate you from me. Because whatever it is, it's simply not worth it. We can have everything. Everything. And by everything I mean everything in Jesus. Or we can have nothing. It's our choice. And this rich young ruler sadly hung his head and walked away and has never heard from again in the pages of history. So we don't know what happened to him. But don't let that be your story. Don't walk away. Let Jesus embrace you. Let him give you the salvation he so freely wants to give. But come to him in obedience. And maybe you can do that this morning. Maybe you can do that right now. Let's together we stand and sing. God is calling the prodigal come without delay. Here I'm here and calling, calling out for me. Though you wandered so far from his presence, come today. Hear his loving voice calling still.
our brother uh, Joe Greenwell uh, has a has a prayer request of us all, and we'll we'll, we'll pray uh, uh, right now as well. But his oldest brother Ron Greenwell uh, is having a, a very serious surgery on his pancreas, and uh, that's that's coming up uh, December second. And he would like us to pray for uh, for for his brother and the success of that. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we are so blessed that you are our loving God, that you care for us, and that you have power that affects our lives, you can change our lives, that, that we can come to you in times of need, and we can, we can lay those things at your feet. So Father, to this morning we pray for, for Joe's brother Ron, who's uh, having surgery coming up uh, on, on his pancreas. And so, Father, we ask that you would, would be with him, be with those that are performing this surgery and taking care of, of him. We ask that you be with Ron's family and, and at this time and, and that they may be of aid to him. Father, please be with Joe as he, uh, as he cares, cares for his brother. Father, we... So grateful that, uh, that these things that, that come up in our lives that uh, have we have little control over that we can we can turn to you and we can uh, ask for your 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 intercession. We are thankful that that you have such great love for us, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Final song this morning will be In Vain, In High, and Holy Lays. I just wanted to mention, uh, Susie and I lost a neighbor this week. He was a good friend and had been neighbors of ours for about 15 years. We'd done a lot of projects and things together. And he was driving into town on Friday and uh, got pulled off the side of the road, had a massive heart attack, and died. So it's a sad thing. His name is Chris Burnell and his wife's name is Christine. And if you remember them in your prayers, it'd be helpful because she's going to face incredible things trying to cope with his loss. It was totally unexpected. Let's sing a song. In faith in high and holy days, my soul, my grateful ones, who raised for me, and sing the worthy grace of the wonderful love of Jesus. Wonderful love, wonderful love, wonderful love of Jesus. Wonderful love, wonderful love, wonderful love of Jesus. A joy by day, a peace by night, and storms are calm in darkness light. In pain of all, in weakness light is the wonderful love of Jesus. Wonderful love. Almighty Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for having us in the palm of your hand. Father, you provide all that we need. Your love for us is unmatched and absolutely amazing. You know the trials and the temptations in each and every one of us. You make the way of escape. You demonstrate the love that you have for us by the by the sacrifice of your son. The word is alive and available for each and every one of us as we go through life, Father. 
Help us not to put idols before you, but in thought and in word and in deed, put you first and foremost in our minds. Help us, Father, as we relate to the world. Help us to act and react in a way that shows that we have a confidence in your Son. That no matter what happens to us in this body, that we know that we have a hope of eternal life. We know that there will be trials and temptations. We know that some of the stuff is brought upon us from the outside, but Father, we pray that you would help us to look inside of our own hearts to clear away the things that still cause us to want to go our own way, to have our own will. Help us not just to love and serve you when it's easy and convenient, but help us to love and serve you when it's not easy and when it's not convenient, when it's not the thing that we want to do. Help us to realize, Father, that there's a greater a greater situation at play that although we may want our way, you're the perfect one. You're the one that has the way of eternal life through your Son. Help us to realize that, Father, that it's not just about what what is shiny and new in front of us, but it's about eternity. Father, we pray that you would bless this nation with godly leadership. We pray that you would bless them and help them to make laws that honor you. We pray that you'd help us to be godly husbands and wives, children. We pray for our families the world over. Father, help us to always lock our eyes on you as well as our heart to seek you to strive to understand your will and your way in our life. Help us to always pursue you first and foremost. Father, as we leave this place, we pray that you would always guard and protect us. Help us to be thankful for all that we have, Father, and to be humble in heart before you. We pray that you would forgive our sins and all these things, Father, we pray in the name of Christ. Amen. Good afternoon, and so happy that you are joining us for our Pikes Peak Worship Stream. A reminder, this afternoon at 5 o'clock, Kevin Ballard's Sunday morning Bible class will be streaming right here, and I know that you'll want to take advantage of that study opportunity. Just a very few announcements. Ladies, you have an event this week, the Ladies' Night Out. That's coming up on November the 18th. Vicki Jones can share with you all the details you need to know. The ladies are getting together at a Korean restaurant, and it's on East Pikes Peak Avenue. And I can say that. I'm not going to try to say the name of the restaurant, but... Get in touch with Vicki and she will fill you in. We want to remember our sister Yvonne Williams in our prayers. Yvonne moved a few months ago down to New Mexico. Yvonne and her brother both have COVID. And while they're not in the hospital, uh, they are sick. And the brother is missing his teaching and coaching responsibilities while he has to stay confined and in quarantine. And we hate so very much that our dear friends, brothers and sisters in the Lord are going through this. So let's remember them in our prayers. And then you'll find in our church bulletin the names of several of our folks who have had surgery in recent days, and we'll add Dan Waterman to that list. Dan had shoulder replacement surgery this last week. He's doing well. But, of course, there will be a time of healing and recovery and rehab, and we want to remember Dan and Cindy. Until the next time when we're all able to be together, may the Lord bless and keep us all.